All righty. Let's see here. What do we got here? What do we got here? What do we got here? Testing. Everything's good with the audio. Um, can you hear me, babe? And uh, are you getting a visual? Yeah. All right, all praises. All right, well, uh, happy Sabbath uh, to the so-called Negroes who are the actual biblical Israelites. It's your brother, St. Micah here, um, here with um, another uh, lesson for you guys. Um, we're doing a, a seven-part series um, called the First Fruits Countdown, and this is uh, uh, week three, so two more weeks after this. And uh, and then it'll be first fruits. So, with that being said, this week we're gonna look at um, the biblical weights and measures. All right, we're gonna look at biblical weights and measures. And uh, if you're tuning in um, here, use a pseudonym. All right, a code name or something because. It's broadcasting uh, uh, live on Facebook. Um, so, you know, um, because truth is always an offense to the liars, right? Which are our governments, you know, the so-called white man, our leaders, right? Are the people that run our institution, um, you know, um, the, the, the so-called uh, European who the most high calls the devil and Satan. The truth is offensive to these people. So um, if you want to uh, move wise as a serpent and humble as a dove, uh, be sure to put a little, uh, you know, a street name or something here um, while you're tuned in, if you're going to be talking or anything like that. All right. So without any uh, further ado, let's get going. Let me just write this in the chat. Yes. Shalom, shalom. If you're speaking, I can't hear you, bro. Okay, audio is connecting. Let's see here, boy. Yeah, shalom, King. I was just telling people, you know, use a use a pseudonym. Uh, you know, on their little street name or whatever if they want, because um, you know. Uh, Esau is the devil, yeah? And, uh, you know, some people want to kind of protect their identity. And the things that we're going into is obviously always going to be burning down and breaking down this dirty, stinking Babylonian system. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's start uh, uh, here in uh, Nehemiah 8. Now, let's see. I think I'm going to share my screen. Are you guys able to see that? Are you guys able to see that? And the, um, and, and, uh, okay. And can you see uh, my camera as well or no? Yeah, we see you and your screen. Okay, great. 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 All right. Nehemiah chapter 8. Well, first we're going to deal with some uh, corrections from last week. So we're going to go to Nehemiah 8. Uh, and uh, we're going to read from uh, 1 to verse 12. Um, uh, bro, Chris, you're going to read today or no? Yeah, I can read. All right, cool. I mean, I mean, brother Maccabeus. <laughs> the real Maccabeus. Oh. Chris, Chris is fine for now, man. Chris I know, fine. I know, I know, I know, man. I'm just, I'm messing with you. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. All right, go ahead. So, 
You want to start from Nehemiah what? Nehemiah? Nehemiah um, 8, and we're going to read from 1, 1 to 12, because I wanted to make a correction um, on the on the um, fat, um, because of those scriptures that you brought out, and when I looked into them, and it adds up, you know, so we're going to go with the thing that adds up according to the word, man, so go ahead. Okay, and so this is the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, and verse number 1, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. One second, hold on. Yeah. Um, okay. I just want to move spots and I think I'm going to get glasses because I'm reading out of my actual... My actual Bible. Okay. Okay. Um, and Ezra, verse number two, and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Math Mattathiah and Shema and Ananiah and Ur Urijah and Hilkiah and Maas. Siel, Maasia, on his right hand, and on his left hand, Pediah, and Mishael, and Malachi, no Malachi, Malachi, and Hashum, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood, stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen. Amen. And lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Right. Also, <clears throat> Jeshua and Benai and... Sherebiah, Jamin, Akud, Shabbatai, Shabbatai, Hodijai, mm -hmm. Maasa, Ma, Maasia, right. Kelita, Azar, Azariah, Joseph, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So this is interesting. They're preaching and they caused the people to understand the law, right? So they didn't stand up there and just, um, you know, uh, uh, read a couple of scriptures and then go into, you know, um, what do you call it? Um, anecdotes, like, like they like to do a lot of times in the Christian church. Now they have a new sleeping pill where, you know, these uh, new pastors like Geno Jennings, they'll go to precepts. Um, now and and then you know try and go to and from uh, to and fro in the Bible like the script like the Mosai says, but again they don't keep the law statutes and commandments. And the Mosai says when you keep the laws, that's when you have a good understanding. A good understanding have all they that do thy commandments. So these guys don't have a good understanding because they don't do the commandments. For example, Geno Jennings doesn't even have a beard on his face, right? And according to the Most High, um, you know. Um, that's a law, right? Um, so I just wanted to, to point out here that, um, you know, the, um, the teachers, the pastors, the overseers, the leaders, they were, they were, uh, causing the people to understand the scriptures. They weren't just inserting their own thing in there, right? They were, they were helping the people to understand what the scriptures were saying, not inserting their own meaning into the scriptures, right? 
Um, and here in Psalm right. 1, 11 and 10, it tells you a good understanding of who all they that do his commandments. So anytime you see a man not doing the most high's commandments, you can guarantee that guy does not have a good understanding of the scriptures. All right. Go ahead. Or that, or that woman, for that matter. Go ahead. Verse 8. Verse number 8. So they read the book in the law. Sorry. So they read the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Right. And Nehemiah, which is the the Tersh, the Tershatha, mm -hmm, which, uh, which Ezra, um, the priest. Go, go, go ahead. Uh, sorry. One second. I just want to touch on Tershatha here. Right. I'm um, pretty sure this means governor. Yeah. What exactly is that? Yeah. Tershatha. Governor, you see that a title used by the Persian governor in Judea, right? And remember, Nehemiah was sent okay. back from Persia to build the temple, so he was the governor. The Tershatha is the governor, really. Oh, yes. That word that is sense. um, yep. Tar Shatha, yeah, Tarshatha, right? Go ahead, okay. Um Verse number nine, and Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Right. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right, so, so, so the this Levite is what I still, wanted. Nope, that's all I want. That's, uh, well, go ahead. You said Finish 12. it, and then, I'll, and then I'll touch on 10. Go ahead. Well, go do 10, and then, and then um, just touch and on 10. you finish? Then, but, Okay, so yeah, this no, is what no, I no. really wanted. It says, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. So here the Mosai says, eat the fat, right? Now go to Leviticus uh, chapter 3. Yeah. Chapter three and which verse? Um, let's see. From like, uh, go go from one and then we'll skip down. Okay. Um, this is the book of Leviticus, chapter three and verse number one. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it, it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the lord right and he shall lay his hand upon the upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and Aaron's sons the priests shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round the boat right here it comes go ahead and he shall offer the sacrifice of peace offerings and offerings made by fire unto the lord the right. fat that covereth the inwards mm -hmm. and all the fat that is upon the inwards Mm -hmm. and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, mm -hmm. which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall be, it shall, it shall he take away. Right. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice. Wait, Aaron's son shall eat it or burn it? Burn it. Aaron's right. son shall burn it on the altar right. upon the burnt sacrifice. Right. Which is upon the wood that is on the fire. Right. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Right. Now jump down to 17. Verse number 17. It shall be a perpetual statue for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. Right. So you see that here in Leviticus 3, 17, it says, don't eat any fat or blood. But when we go to Nehemiah 8 and 10, it says, eat the fat. 
So what's going on here? Is this a contradiction in the scriptures? Right? I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's just mistranslation. Well, yeah. Um, I, and I'll show you, I'll show you guys what's going on. When we go into the Hebrew, here in verse four, it says, and the two kidneys and the, excuse me, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, the call above the liver with the kidneys, shall he take away, right? So this word fat here is kalab. Kalab. That's it. Kalab. All right. This H with the dot at the bottom, that's how it's uh, pronounced. You can look that up later on your own. Okay. That's kalab. Okay. So that fat <clears throat> called the kalab. Let's go into it. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 okay, I don't know why I didn't want to go into that like that there. All right. Um, yeah, so that Kalab, he says in verse three, um, sorry, he says in verse five, Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice which is upon the wood that is on the fire, right? It says they shall burn the what? The kalab, right? So, so let's go to numbers now and see, sorry, Nehemiah and see what fat he's talking about eating. So he said, burn the kalab, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, right here in verse 10, it says, eat the fat, Right, English translators from KJV translated the word the same as fat, but the word here is they say misman. That's um, this is a modern Hebrew. Paleo Hebrew would be mashman. Okay, mashman. All right. So he says eat the mashman. He didn't say eat the kalab. So there is a difference between the mashman and the kalab. You understand? And uh, the the mashman is here's what the mashman is. Uh, let's see. Uh, I like to use the brown driver brakes again because scholars don't dispute these things. Um, not that they're the um, be all and end all, but really that's you know when people are arguing with you concerning the scriptures they put their faith in these people right and to give them their credit they have done a lot of um, work um you know to get gain some knowledge on history because remember the most i said the earth shall help the woman which means what archaeology that's part of the meaning of that archaeology is going to help the woman meaning israel to be able to prove the things that we're saying right so we don't place our whole faith in these things but we use these things after we have the precepts anyway um, it says here, the mashman is what? The fat, the fertile place. You see that? Right? They trust the brown driver breaks, the fat, the fertile place. All right? Um, let's see here. Whoa. Jacinius also trusted. Fat, fertile meadows. You see that? The fatness of his flesh, the fertile, the fertile meadows, the fat soldiers, meaning the strongest, the robust. So when the Mosai says, eat the fat, what is he really saying? Right? When he says, eat the mash man, what is he really saying? Brother Chris. Go ahead. Sorry. No. Um. Did you catch what I said? Not 100%. So when he's saying, eat the yeah, in um, Nehemiah 8, he says, go your way and eat the fat. Hold on. Let me leave this. Yep. I got it. In Nehemiah 8, he says, go, go your way and eat the mashman. He doesn't say, go eat the kalab, right? It's because the mashman, the fat, stands, for the mashman, that which they translate as fat, stands for fatness, fat peace, fertile place. Here's what we want. Richly prepared food. 
Because remember, Nehemiah and them were dealing with a feast. So that's what the Mosai is saying. Eat the mashman, which is the richly prepared food. Right? The stoutness, the vigor, right? The best, the robust stuff. Right? Eat that. Right? Remember, he's saying it, hey, it's the it's the um it's the Shabbat. You guys can't be crying all over the place. Right? This is not a time for mourning. Uh he says here in verse uh which verse is it? Uh, verse 9, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law, and the Mosai say, hey, go your way, eat the fat, right? For this day is holy unto Yahweh, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. So this says, eat the mash, man, right? Now, when we go back to, um, what were we in there? One second. Leviticus, Leviticus 3. 3. When we go back to Leviticus 3, right? He says, don't eat the fat. Let's look at that word. Right? Um, so all your generations that you eat, neither this word here, kalab. It's not the same word. It's not mashman. Right? Because again, the Mosai is not the author of confusion. He put two different words there. Right? He said, um, do not eat kalab and don't eat blood. Right? And then it, uh, if you read verse, I believe it's three and four, he'll tell us what the Kalab is, just like you brought out, Brother Chris, right? Um, outline of biblical usage, don't eat the fat, fat of humans, fat of beasts, okay? This is not talking about don't eat the choicest part. It, this doesn't make any sense in this context, Right? The Mosai is not saying, oh, don't eat the choicest part of the animal, because we just looked at Nehemiah where he said, eat the choice parts of the animal, eat the, the richly prepared food, eat the shoulder. The shoulder was actually, um, uh, the right shoulder was actually reserved for the priests, you know? So, so the Mosai has us eaten the fat in that way, right? Which is the mash man. But what he doesn't want us to eat is the kalab. Uh, and, um, I'll read it, it says, from unused root, meaning to be fat. Fat, whether literally or figuratively, hence the richest choice part. Not what we want, not correct. This is what we're looking for. The grease. Don't worry, I don't know, don't worry about this marrow thing. That's not, that's not what he's talking about. The most I never talked about that, okay? So don't get, um, don't get you know, paranoid now about chewing your bones if you cook your food well. You understand what I'm saying? Um, what he's talking about is this grease. Don't eat this grease. Now let's look at um, uh, uh, the specifics because he tells us what the kalab is, as you pointed out um, uh, last week, bro. Age 25, right. 29. Right. 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 So um, give me, uh, give me, put it, give me from three to four this is what he's saying don't eat okay this is the book of Levit leviticus chapter three and verse number three and he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the lord and the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them which is by the flank and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. Okay, so stop right there. Now, watch this. He, he tells you about the fat that covers the inwards, the fat that is upon the inwards, the two kidneys and the fat that's on the kidneys, right? Um, uh, by the flanks and the call above the liver. This is a major clue. With the kidneys, he shall take it. He shall take it away. So let's look at this call. Call of a sheep, right? See that? Yeah, that that don't look edible in the first place. But <laughs> yeah, but guess what? They they use this to make sausages. They use it to make all type of things. Yeah. Oh, they use it to make sausages. Yeah. Yeah, right there. It tells you. Uh, uh, where, where is it? Call fat, also known as lace fat or mentum, 
or fat netting is the thin membrane which surrounds the internal organs of some animals such as cows, sheep, and pigs, also known as greater omentum. It is used as a casing for sausages. See that? Roulades, patties, and various other meat dishes, right? So the most I said, don't eat that. And then the other thing you brought out, what was it called? Um, that is used so in beef patties. Yeah. So what? Yeah. So these are the things the most I telling us don't eat. Don't eat that thing. Um, that covers the uh, the liver. Don't eat that. And this and don't eat this. This um uh, sweat here. Right. Look at that. That's pure fat, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The most I say, don't eat that. Burn that. That's mine. Right. Um, suet is the raw hard fat of beef, lamb, or mutton found around the loins and the kidneys. You see that? Right. Yeah. So it has a melting point, so on, so on, and so forth. Watch this. The primary use of suet is to make tallow. Um, although right. it is also used as an ingredient in cooking, especially traditional big pudding, such as British Christmas pudding, of course. Sweat is made into tallow in a process called rendering, which involves melting the fat, so on and so forth, and so on. Anyway, so you know, check check out for things that have tallow and sweat in them, right? Um, but my point here was that the most I gave specifics, right? Because I was talking about, okay, what about um, butter, right? Which is the fat of a milk. Well, if you boil milk, it still has fat in it. But it's not the same. It's not the same, exactly, and that's how that's um part of the clues that led uh, that showed me it cannot be talking about those things because a right. a um, 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 mother's breast milk has fat in it. Exactly. The 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 cow the cows uh the cow milk have fat in it even after you boil it and skim it, right? So this is you know, when I put those precepts together and 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 meditated on these things, I realized what you're saying is uh, is a hundred percent true. And also in Genesis, Abraham fed those men them butter, fed well, them butter and milk. Well, to, the 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 translation is actually curds. It's cheese. Okay, but it's it's that same thing. The fat, right? It's just it's the same part. It's the same thing, but it's just produced. Yes. It, it, yeah. They take out all the water from it to make the to make the curds. Right. Right. But right. with the with butter, it still I believe it still has um like some of the liquid in it or something. I don't know. But it's, it's just the skimming. The they boil the milk and they skim the top and then they mix that with some stuff and, and churn it around. You can look it up and churn okay. it around in a big vat and it turns into butter. Okay. Right? Yeah, the cheese is made by shaking the milk. You When you shake the milk, uh, the, the certain um, parts in the uh, certain, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, molecules in the milk coagulate. They stick together, right? And that's the cheese. Right. Um, anyway, so I wanted to bring that out real quick before we got into anything, um, because uh, that is correct. All right. So we're good on the butter. All right. Just don't eat those um, particular fats off the animals. All right. So numbers 15. Numbers 15. We're going to look at these biblical weights and measures, right? The ephah, the hin, and uh, the omer. Because when we make our sacrifice for first fruits coming up, the Most High um, have an ordinance to bring certain um, amounts of certain things in for the sacrifice, right? For the feast, right? And, you know, as, as the people on here uh, know and if you're visiting, you might not know, but we do our best to do things according to the ordinance, right? Because the most I keeps repeating in the scriptures, um, do things according to the ordinance, according to the writing. He likes things done decently and in order, right? So right. We're trying to do our thing decently and in as much order as possible, right? Because of our love for the most high. All right. Um, numbers 15, and we'll go from one to five. It's the book of Numbers, chapter 15, and verse number one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you become into the land of your habitations, which I give unto you, and will, uh, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice in performing a vow or in a free will offering or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd or the flock, sorry, or of the flock. Hold on a second. I just want to point out here, right? This numbers 15 verse three is a bit of a cheat sheet. And I brought it out in um, some previous lessons on this series. It tells you, hey, the things I'm about to tell you here, you can use this for your sacrifices in your solemn feasts, which we know is Shabbat, all the feasts, um, uh, uh, new moon. Um, did I miss anything? Your free will offerings, right? He said, here's how you can do all these various things. Read on. Um, verse number four. Verse four. Then, shall, then shall he that offereth his offering unto the Lord bring a meat offering of a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hin of oil and the fourth part of a hin of wine for a drink offering shalt thou prepare with the burnt offering or a sacrifice for one lamb. Right. And it goes on and it tells you about the sacrifice for a ram. And it goes on and it tells you about the sacrifice for a whole um, a bullock as well. Right. Um, but what I want to bring out here is what is a tenth deal? Uh, let's see here. Verse four. Uh, bring a, a meat offering, which is what? A grain offering of a tenth deal of flour mingled with a fourth part of a hin of oil. So what is a tenth deal of flour? Right? What is the fourth part of a hin of oil? Right? And that's what we're going to focus our lesson on trying to figure out today. What are these weights and measures that the Most High is talking about? Right? Do you, do you know how much a tenth deal of uh, flour is? Uh, Chris? No idea. Nope, no idea. Okay. I'm Googling it right now. Don't Google it, brother. Well, yeah, we'll see. L look at it, but let's go through the precepts. Yeah? Yeah. So we'll figure out um, what, what this 10th um, deal um, of flour uh, mingled with the fourth part of a hin of oil is. Okay? What is a deal? What is a hin? Right. Um, first, first and foremost, let's realize that uh, this word deal <clears throat> isn't even in the Hebrew. <laughs> Watch what it actually says. Then shall he that offereth his offering unto Yahweh bring a meat offering. The English says of a tenth deal. Right. I never clicked on this. What does it say? Okay, it just shows you places where they have translated deal. <clears throat> of a tenth deal of flour. The Hebrew says, <clears throat> man, man ka, um, isharan. Isharan. Isharan, yeah. That's what it says. Man ka isharan. Now, what is this? Uh, now, <clears throat> what does man ka mean? Again, you're always going to see the, you know, modern Hebrew translation, right? You're never going to see the paleo, but we know how to, to, we know what they do, do to make it modern so we can get back to the paleo. Okay. Man ka, gift, tribute, offering, present, oblation, sacrifice, meat offering. All right. Uh, let's see. Gift, oblation, meat offering, present, sacrifice. Okay. All those are good. Grain, grain offering. Right. Let's go back. Um, he shall offer. Sorry. Wait, hold on. Um, when he bring what? Um, a meat offering, a mancha. 
right? Because it's talking about the sheep. So within that context, you know, this is talking about the sheep, the, 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 the um, verse before. Where is it here? Uh, sorry. This is a grain offering here in verse four, right? Still following? Yeah, yep. Okay, so yeah, right I'm there, looking at it all. Yeah, I can see it on your on the screen, and I'm looking at it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it says the manka is the green offering. Okay. So when you bring a manka, a green offering, it says bring a um, bring karab manka green offering isaron or or, or rather um, uh, isharan. Bring a green offering isharan. What does Isharan mean? You see what it says? Tenth part, tithe, right? Bring a grain offering of a tithe, right? Where's the word deal? Right? Where's the word deal in the Hebrew? It's simply not there. A meat or uh, bring your mancha, your grain offering. Ish um isharan, a tenth. But it's translated as a tenth deal. Right. So what's going on here? Right. Why did they put tenth deal here when it literally just says a tenth? What's a deal anyway, right? Well, we can figure it out um, using the scriptures and some historical research. Okay, where does the, 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 the deal come from? The deal comes from the translators. I'm gonna show you guys. It comes from the translators because the word's not in the Hebrew text. Right? Here's where they got it. In Jewish Antiquities, book number three, page uh, uh, entry 250 to 251, which I actually have the book here. Um, I swear I had the link as well. One second. I'm pretty sure I have the link open. Let me see. Uh, 250, is this 250? No. But I do have, let me see if I can find it right here real quick. Yeah, what is this you're reading this on? Um, this is a, a, a um, website called archive.org. It's an online library that has almost every book, man. Archive, you, that's, that, that's what I was asking you about a couple of days ago, but you, you didn't, um, you thought I was asking you about Kindle, no, not Kindle. Um, what's the other one you use? Um, I'm not sure. Um, to read books on, man. Uh, oh, uh, maybe Google? I'm not sure. No, it wasn't Google. It was another one. It was, um, I don't know. I don't remember what it is. But it's, it's ar archive.org? Dot, archive dot yeah, archive.org. Right. Um, let's see, man. I have the actual book. Dave, can you pass me that book there, please? Let me see if I can just um, pull it up to share to show you guys. Not mine. I will have to give the people back their book. Uh, book three. Let's see here. Book three. Antiquities of the Jews, 215. It's not open, man. What's going on? And it's just archive.org? Mm-hmm. Hmm. You have to be on a. I can't. It won't open for some reason. Yeah, I think you have to um, sign up. But yeah. Even, uh, oh. Archive.org. I see. I see. I see what's happening. 
Yeah. So, um, wow, is this going to show? Nope. Let me, let me, I'm going to find it. They take a handful of airs. One second. Really? <laughs> what page is this? One second. Mm -hmm. This is P. This is page one thirty three. All right, perfect. Perfecto. All right, so this is where they got it from. Josephus is the most trusted um, historian on um, Hebrew affairs, all right? Um, I mean, I'm not sure if he was a Hebrew or an Edomite. I, I'm leaning towards him being a Hebrew sellout, basically, um, because he he was a general um, uh, among uh, the Sikar. No, no, he wasn't. Um, anyway, look him up. I don't want to say um, stuff about him that's not true, but he's the mo he's the most trusted um, uh, figure in history in writings about the Hebrews because his books were written like very very early. Uh, like yeah, I'm talking seventy, the seventies between the seventies and eighties. Okay, after Yahawashai died, just after the temple got destroyed, he wrote these books. So he would have been there and seen exactly how we were doing um, our offerings, all of these things, right? Um, so they trust, the historians trust this guy, uh, this guy's word um, to learn about the Hebrews. And he wrote a hell of a large book um, about the whole situation, right? I mean, the book is, it's not nothing easy, right? And this is what he says on page 133. He says, but on the second day of unleavened bread, which is the 60th day, 16th day of the month, they first eat of the um, fruits of the earth. For before that day, they do not touch them, and while they suppose it proper to honor God, from whom they obtain this plentiful provision, in the first place, they offer the first fruits of their barley. And that in the manner following. So here's what they do. They take a handful of the airs and dry them, then beat them small and separate the barley from the bran. They then bring one tenth deal to the altar to God. You see that? And cast one handful of it upon the fire, right? So where did they get this whole concept of the tenth deal? Um, they got it from Josephus, right? Once Josephus um, was able to, they got the confirmation, I should say, from Josephus. Once they seen that Josephus, um, you know, ba is backing up this um, offering as a deal, they were comfortable to um, translate it as a deal, okay? 
So that's where this deal word comes from. But in the Hebrew, it's simply not there. Okay. Let's go to um, let's go to Ezekiel forty five. So what were our ancestors talking about when they were when they when they wrote down a tenth, right? What is this tenth deal that that um, these guys are talking about? Ezekiel forty five in what verse? Ezekiel forty five. Um, let's see. We'll go. Um, from verse 10. 10? Yeah. Um, this is the book of Ezekiel, chapter 45, and verse number 10. You shall have just balance and a just ephah and a just bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of one measure that the bath may contain the tenth part of an homer and the ephah the tenth part of an homer the measure thereof shall be after the homer and the shekels continue or, or... no i think that's all i wanted so first of all the most i said he needs just balances a just ephah and a just bath meaning what that thing have to be accurate he wants it accurate that's the standard right accuracy before, they used to have um, different weights, right? And you read about this in history books. They had a heavy ephah, for example, and a light ephah, right? And uh, they had a, a heavy bath uh, uh, or a full bath, um, um, for lack of better words, and a half bath, right? That's not what they called it, but I'm just saying for lack of better words, okay? Okay. Um, but the most I said, hey, one measurement. Don't change the measurement. I want to just ephah and I want to just bath. Okay. That being said, he starts to break down to you what is this um these what are these uh these uh measurements are sort of equivalent to, right? So it says here. The ephah and the bath shall be of one measure. So the ephah and the bath, it's the same, right? Same measure, right? Um, as far as weight goes. Then he tell you the that the bath contains a tenth part of a homer with an H, right? And the ephah is a tenth part of a homer as well. So a tenth part is what? In a fraction, in fraction form. Right? Well, if I say give me a tenth part of a dollar, what am I saying? You're asking for a dime. I'm asking for a dime, yeah. One tenth of a dollar is a one dime. One tenth of a dollar, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm asking for. So he's telling you the ephah and the bath is one measure. Both the ephah and the bath is one tenth of something called a homer. Homer. Right? You start to see a pattern here. One tenth of this is that, one tenth of that is this. And we just read, he said, bring me a tenth. They inserted the word deal. He just said, bring me a tenth. So was God asking for a tenth of a bath? Sorry, an ephah? Was he asking for a tenth of an omer? A tenth of a bath? What was he really asking for? The precepts are going to show us, right? So read 11 again, and then I'll, I'll state a couple of um, things to notice that come from 11. Go ahead. Um, the ephah and the bath shall be of one measure, that the bath may contain the tenth part of an homer, and the ephah the tenth part of an homer. Right. The measure thereof shall be after the homer. Right. Great. So a couple of things. The ephah and the bath are the same. 
the bath is one tenth of the homer, right? The ephah is also one tenth of the homer. And both of these measurements are taken from the measurement of the homer, right? So if the homer is the, 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 the measuring line, the, the foundation of these um, measures, what then is the homer, right? But to find out what the homer is, there's a little subtlety that I, I want to um, uh, uh, kind of point out. You're going to see a Homer written in the Bible, and you're going to see an, an Omer without the H. It's not the same thing, right? Let's go look at the Homer, the Homer first, right? Actually, I have this here already, so let's just look from here. That of the bath may contain the 10th part of an Homer. You see that here? Homer. Yeah. Homer. Right. Homer. Yeah. Homer. So again, that's the that's that's that modern Hebrew um yeah. uh, translate um pronunciation. But really this word is Khamar. Khamar. Yeah, Khamar. That's what it is. Khamar. Right? Ha. Ah, it's like a uh it's like a throat, a throat K basically. Like a almost like you're hawking up spit. Hamar. Like a spit, like a hawk, yeah. Yeah, it's a hawk, like hamar. That's what it is. Yeah. Right? So what is the hamar? Right? Okay, let's go see. Um, let's see here. Um, is this what I wanted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says here, this is definitely not what I wanted. This is definitely not what I wanted. We're going to read this anyway. Khamar. Properly, let's go down to the brown drivers. Mortar cement for holding building stones or bricks together. As material of vessels in simile of God's fashioning man what uh clay um that's not what I want for ceiling that's what I want a heap a mound a heap a mound okay because it's a certain measure hence a chamar a measure of dry things containing 10 baths all right a chamar all right Cool. This is what I want, a heap, a mound. Now, that's the hamar, all right, which is um, spelled like this, this here, right? K-H-A-M-A-R. If you really wanted to actually transliterate it, this is what it would be. And then you have the omer, right? Um, you're going to see something really cool. You guys are going to see something really cool here. The Omer is, uh, anyway, I don't want to give it away. Let's see here. Where is it? Huh? Oh, watch this. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 19. All right, bring that out for me, please, brother. Um, this is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, 24, and verse number 19. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all thy work of thine right. hand. Right, right. So it says, when thou cuttest down thy harvest and thy field, and thou hast forgotten a sheaf. Watch this, right? The, the word sheaf here is what? Omer. You see that? This word, which is actually imar, not omer, it's imar. Huge difference if you actually just transliterate the thing properly. No one would mistake a kamar for a imar, right? But Satan likes to create confusion, right? So 
whatever. But we can read and we can do research and we have patience so we could go check the thing out, right? So the sheaf, the word sheaf, the word imar is translated as sheaf, right? So the khamar is a heap. The imar or the omer, the khamar or the homer is a, a, a mound. The imar or the omer without the H is a sheaf, okay? Um, now that we know the difference between the two, right? Let's find out what the khamar is, right? And then what the imar is, right? Um, by breaking down these um, scripts that we that we have here. Let's go to Exodus uh, 16. Right, we're gonna look at, at the clues about the measurement of the Imar, right? Because once we get one of these measurements pinned down, they're all relative, right? Notice it said, uh, you know, the Omer, the uh, the the um, ephah is one tenth of the Homer or the Kamar, right? Right, it says the ephah is one tenth. Ephah is one tenth of the homer, which is the khamar, right? And the bath is also one tenth of the khamar. Uh, you got it? Exodus 16. So which because verse do you these, need? Which verse? Go from 16. Exodus so because 16, these uh, measures 16? are, yeah, go from 16. So because these measurements are, um, what do you call it, uh, related, once we can pin down one, right, we can start to pin down all of them, right? So we're going to try to pin down the MR, which is the OMER without the H, right? Okay, this so, is the book of Exodus. Go ahead. Know where to go. This is the book of Exodus, chapter 16, and verse number 16. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. An omer or an imar for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. Continue. Um, sorry, uh, before you read that, go to verse 36 first. 36. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Exodus 16 and chapter 36. Now an omer is a tenth part an, of an ephah. Yeah, you see that? Yep. The, the omer or the imar is one tenth of the ephah. Let me see if I... Um... Is the paint program here? Is the paint program? There we go. So you have the Homer with an H, right? Then the breakdown of the Homer is the EFA, and the breakdown of the EFA. is the MR. I should have put it out, the Omer, damn it. I did not write that well. Right. 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 
Oh, I should okay. say one tenth times ten. Yeah. Just trying to make this uh, not confusing. Does that make sense? I don't know. I can't even see what you're writing. Oh, really? No, we, can't. we can only see um, the Bible Hub. I mean, blue letter. That's weird. Okay, one second. Let's see here. I thought I was sharing my screen. Uh, share screen. Screen. Okay, now I see it. Can you see that? Yeah. All right, great. So you see that the um, the Omer, oh my gosh. All right, this, these are one, oops, Lord, this is ugly, but you get it. Right? Yeah. You guys get it. Yep. The Kamar is the Omar, the Imar is the Omar, the Ifa is one tenth, one tenth, right? And this is one tenth times ten, which is the the base measurement. This is the base measurement. Right? Or right at the top one, if you understand what I'm saying. They're, they, they're all measured from the Kamar. Great. Okay, so where were you at? It's 16 it's so i just read the, i just read the last verse which was 36 i believe and now go back to 16 all right exodus 16 to 16 um this is the thing which the lord hath commanded gather of it every man according to his eating an omer for every man according to the number of your persons take ye every man for them which are in his tents and continue and the children of israel did so and gathered some and gathered some more some less right go ahead are uh, you going till 25 brother okay and when they did meet and when they did meet it with an omer he that gathered or he that gathered much had nothing over and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So stop and right there. It said, when they did meet it with an omer. Notice that? It said, the word meet here. Where is it? When they had meet it. Mada, madad. Okay? That's measure. The measure. measure. Right? So they actually used the emar or the Omer as a measure as well, right? The Omer is used as a particular measure. So they measured out what? The manna. This is um, our people gathering manna in the wilderness, right? It said they measured it with an Omer. Whoever gathered uh, much didn't have anything over and so on and so forth. Read on. Um, and Moses said, let no man leave it till the morning. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. They but some listen. of them, they didn't listen, but some of them left of it until the morning. And it bred worms mm -hmm. and stank. Mm -hmm. And Moses was wroth with them. All right. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread. Right. Two omers for one man. So hold on. On the preparation day, they gathered what? How much for one man? Two omers for one man. Right. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Right. So all these are clues. The most I told you earlier on in verse 15 and 16, they um, gathered um, uh, an omer or an imar per person in the house, right? So this imar is enough to feed one person for a day, 
Because the most I told them, hey, just take one. You only need one um, MR for each person for the day. And on preparation day, they gathered two. Why? One for um, uh, the preparation and one for the Shabbat. For Shabbat, yeah. Because there was no gathering on the Shabbat. So then whatever this MR is, it's enough to feed one person for a day. Read on. And he said unto them, this is that which the Lord have said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today and sieve that which you will sieve and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until until the morning. Mm -hmm. And they laid it up till the morning and Moses bade them as Moses bade them. Mm -hmm. And it did not stink. Neither was neither was there any worms therein. Right. And Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Right. Right. So these are, these are some clues on the MR, right? Number one, it was the tenth part, one-tenth of what? An ephah. And an ephah is one-tenth of an, uh, an omer or the chamar. So out of the three, the smallest one is the imar. Out of the ifa, the chamar, and the imar, the imar is the smallest one. And we can see that it's enough to feed one person per day. Right? Give me 32. Verse number 32. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. You see that? So this is the second time we're seeing the imar used as a measure again. The most I say, hey, fill an imar of the manna and hold that so your generations can see. Now, is he saying fill a warehouse? Is he saying, you know, fill a, 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 a field, no. right? No, he said fill an MR, something small enough to feed a man for a day, right? Now, if you bought a bag of flour at the supermarket, could you make enough food with that for the day? Yes. Okay. So we're starting to see what's what's what what's really going on here, right? Go, um, give me thirty-three. This is the book of Exodus, chapter sixteen, and verse number thirty-three. And Moses said unto Aaron, "Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generation." Right. So you see, he didn't say take a he didn't say take um a warehouse. He didn't say take a donkey cart, you know. He didn't say take a, 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 a you know, um, a pitcher, you know. He didn't say take um, uh, barrels, you know, a water pitcher. I mean, when I say a pitcher, the same thing that Yahweh Shai um, had them fill and then, uh, you know, turn it into wine. He didn't say that. He said take an imar. Uh, and, and, and he said, take a, a jar and put the MR in the jar. So the MR is supposed to be able to fit in the uh, 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 so-called pot, actually. And what is this word? This word is um, san, san sanat, san sanat, right? San sanat, when you look into it, a jar, all right? See that? That's not that big. That's my point here, right? The MR is not a huge um, uh, 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 amount of uh, uh, dry, dry goods. That's what I'm trying to prove here with the scriptures, right? Let's go to Ruth chapter 2. Oops. Read from where? 
um, go from seven. Okay, this is the book of Ruth, chapter two and verse number seven. Hold on, before she, you start. So there's a couple more clues here in, in Ruth that's going to really solidify what's going on. Now we're trying to figure out the MR. Once we figure out the MR based on um, the uh, proportions that we have, once we figure out the MR uh, here, we can figure out the rest of the measures, right? Because they're all in proportion to one another, right? Um, Go ahead, brother. This is the book of Ruth, chapter two and verse number seven. And she said, I pray you, let, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Among the what? Just among the sheaves. Hold on right there. Hold on right there. This word sheaves is what word again? Omer. I'm right. Yep. So when the most I say bring a sheaf of a wave offering, <laughs> are we starting to see what he was saying to bring? Yeah. Bring an omer of, of wheat. That's it. Right? And the, yo, our ancestors were into this thing so hardcore. And the most I give us such precise um uh uh directions that we we knew what size of bundle would give you what weight of uh, of uh, a final product. Mm -hmm. So when the Most High asks for certain things, he's asking for these things, knowing the exact weight. Remember, he's the one that tells you just you need a just efa, right? And a just um, and a just, just balance. Uh, a just, sorry, yeah, he said he he needs just balances and just weights. So he gives you things that's going to um, uh, ensure or, that you have just balances and just weights that you can work about with. A, a just homer or a just bath or something like that. Um, yeah. Know, something or... Yeah, paraphrasing, right? Just yeah. uh, you need a just uh, a bath and a just ephah, right? Um, if I remember correctly. But anyway, uh, where you at? The MR, I'm the sheaves. Yeah, I'm still in seven at the sheaves. So Go I'll ahead. start from, from the beginning of seven again. And yeah. she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now mm -hmm. that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in the sorry go not to glean in another field neither go from hence but abide here fast by my maidens All right let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap mm -hmm. and go thou after them mm -hmm. have i not charged the young men that they shall not touch that they shall not touch thee and what when thou art art a thirst go unto the vessel and drink of the of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed him and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me, show, showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother in law since the death of thine husband. Mm -hmm. And how that has left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and, and the land of what? Thy na nativity. Right. Go ahead. And are come unto a people which thou knowest not. Therefore, mm -hmm. sorry, herefore. Here to no, four. here, here to four, here to four. The Lord recompense thy work, and full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel mm -hmm. unto under whose wing thou art come to trust. Mm -hmm. Then she said, let me, let me find favor in thy sight, in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me. And for that thou hast, thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid. Mm -hmm. Though I be not like 
unto one of thine handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come now hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her, and he reached her, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was and was sufficed and left. Wait, what did you pass? Oh, I'm 14. Man. Oh, that was 14. Okay. Oh, my yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of lost. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheets and, repro and reproach her not. Right. And so let, Boaz said, hold on, Boaz said, let her glean even among the sheaves. What does that mean? Right? Let her, um, if the reapers reap and she's gleaning among the sheaves, right? What does that mean? She's taking the leftovers, what's left. She's like cleaning everything off. The reapers are taking all the big stuff and she's going into whatever, whatever's left over. She, she's cleaning it up. Like the, the little the little pieces that are left. Well, we'll see. That no, that's not quite right. But as we read on, you you it'll it'll make it a bit more clear. Go ahead. Okay. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may clean them, and rebuke her not. So stop right there. It said, "Let fall also some of the what? The handfuls." All so right. like the big now, bundles. Well, it said the handfuls. And, and, and if you go back to, um, if you go back to, where's the verse I wanted here? Read verse seven again. Verse seven. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So right. She so, came. so stop right there. It said the handfuls. Then it said she was gathering after the reapers. Let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So when the reapers finished doing what they're doing, what was there in the field left? for her to pick up it said handfuls it called them sheaves and it said she picked that up after the reapers yeah right so what size is this sheaf what size is this mr what you're saying it's a handful well let's see what the bible says right um one, uh, go, sorry, go back and read 16. Yeah, I'll 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 continue from 16. And it says, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them. Meaning what? Pick them up. He's telling the reapers, let the handfuls fall, right? Meaning what? Let the sheaves fall. Right? Um, and leave them for her to glean them, meaning gather them or pick them up. Right? That she may glean la cat. Pick, gather up. Right? Pick or gather up. Right? Let her pick them up. And it says in 17, so she gleaned, meaning picked up in the field until even, and beat out that she had picked up. And here's the key. It was about an ephah of barley, right? So after she, she gleaned in the field until the evening, and she beat it out, she ended up with about an ephah worth of barley. So this is a big clue, right? If Ruth is binding up 
in Mars all day, like it tells you in, in seven, right? Um, uh, let me glean, meaning pick up and gather, right? After the reapers among the sheaves. You see that? So she came and I've continued even until the morning, until now, from the morning until now. So she was there from morning. Then she stopped. It says she tarried a little in the house. She stopped. She spoke to Boaz. She kept gleaning because Boaz said, um, uh, let's see. Boaz said here. Uh, Boaz said right here, let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Right, so she's gathering a Mars sheaves a Mars all day. By the time the day ends, she has what about an ephah worth of barley? And remember, we know the ephah, right, is more is more than the mr, right? The ephah is more than the mr, which is the omer. The ephah is more. So when she was gathering all day and beat it out, the MRs, she ended up with an EFA worth, which is what? 10 Omers, which are 10 MRs, all right, in Paleo Hebrew. All so right. an, an EMR was a, was a handful? It's a handful. A handful. A handful of uh, of uh, green. That's why the most I say wave it in the we in the wave offering. The wave offering was a tenth, right? No. Right. Okay. Um, let's see what I got here. So after, yeah, so what I was saying is after um, a whole day of gathering and beating out, she ended up with an EFA. She ended up with 10 MRs after the whole day, right? And remember, an MR is enough for one person to eat for a day, right? When they were getting the manna, she came to gather food because she just came to town with uh, Naomi, if I remember correctly. Ruth came with Naomi and she was young because Naomi was old. So she went and do work, man, in the field. Go get some food, you know? And she went to the, the rich Israelite, Boaz, to go out the door. right, to get food. And, uh, you know, he helped her out, right? By allowing her to gather these imars in the field. <clears throat> right? So right here, we have the proof that the MR uh, is one-tenth uh, of the uh, the EFA, right? Or, or rather, uh, you know, we're seeing that the MR has to be smaller than the EFA. I'll see that, right? We already know it's one-tenth. So if the Most High said she was gathering MRs, and at the end of the day, she came out with an EFA, we know she gathered about you know, 10 MRs. All right, so let's see here. Let's go to Ezekiel 45. Or, or, or rather bundles, I should say, right? As opposed to handfuls, right? Because, uh, you know, you it wouldn't take you a whole day to gather a handful of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, wheat, right? So it would have to be bundles, sort of like... Uh,
One second. Ezekiel 45 and verse yeah. 11. Verse 11? Yeah. This is the book of Ezekiel, chapter 45 and verse number 11. The ephah and the bath shall be, one, shall be of one measure, that the bath may contain a tenth part of an homer, and the ephah the tenth part of an homer. The measure thereof shall be after the homer. All right. So the ether the, is the tenth part of the homer or the chamar, right? Again, we see the pattern, right? A, a chamar is, uh, let's go back to the um, illustration. Here. The chamar is 10 times bigger than the ephah, and the ephah is 10 times bigger than the imar or the omer. Okay. Um, our measures for dry goods are broken down into tenths, with the smallest one for the dry goods being the MR. Right. Therefore, when Yah says bring a tenth with your offering, is he asking for a Kamar, an Ifa, or an Imar? Right? Is he asking for the largest measure of the dry goods, or is the most asking for the smallest measure of the dry goods? Well, we keep seeing the word imar, right? And we can see that the ephah was made of imars, right? And then 10 uh, ephahs made a kama. So knowing this, we can say the most I was asking for an imar. And, we, and we'll prove that with the scriptures, Acts 20 and verse 35. Acts 20, verse 35. Let's see what the Mosa is in the habit of. Is the Mosa in the habit of exacting large sums from his people? Or does he always take something small? All right? This is the book of Acts, chapter 20, and verse number 35. I have showed you all things. How that so, how that so, sorry, how that so laboring he ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Yahweh Shai. How he said, Go ahead. How he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. See that? So Yahweh Shai said, It's more blessed to give than to receive. That being said, do, you, do we think the Most High would be asking our people to bring large, you know, portions of their stuff to him when he says it's no. more blessed to, to give than to receive no exodus 30 and verse 15 it's the book of exodus chapter 30 and verse number 15 the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half of than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for their for your soul. You see that? So the Mosai said, Hey, listen, the rich man can't give more than half a shekel, and a poor man can't give more than half a, uh, a shekel. Right? Now, if is half a shekel a large amount or not, right? Let's find out. Right, go to um, go to Second Kings, Chapter Seven. Right, and uh, we'll read from verse one. It says, 
Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now we're trying to find out if a shekel is a lot um, of money or not, right? Um, the scriptures show that it's not because this man is told by Elisha the prophet that two measures of fine flour, good flour, are going to be sold for a shekel. And he says, this is impossible, basically, right? And then the Most High makes it come to pass, right? So let's read here. It says, then Elisha said, hear ye the word of Yahweh, thus saith Yahweh, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered to the man of God and said, Behold, if Yahweh would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, and he said, meaning the man of God said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Right? So this measure of fine flour, right, being sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel, had to be a deal because this guy is like, oh, this is impossible. Now let's go down here to see what happened to him after he doubted, right? Verse 15, they went after them unto Jordan and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels. So basically what happened is the Most High allowed the, um, the Syrians to hear a noise of war and they all left their camp and ran. And um, um, two brothers from Israel came up uh, upon the camp and saw that there was no one there. So they started taking all their stuff. Um, and then they went and told the king. So that's why we had an overabundance of stuff. And that's why um, the fine flour was sold so cheap. Okay. So we're reading the end of that account. And they went after them unto Jordan and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of Yahweh. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. So this is the same guy who was, this is the same Lord or master that was doubting, right? And Elisha told him, Yeah, you're going to see. The, the the measure of fine flour sold for a shekel, but you're not going to eat of it, right? This is the same guy. It says, and the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass, as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel, shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, now, behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people showed upon him in the gate, and he died. Right? The point here being, this guy thought it was impossible for two measures of fine flour to be sold for a shekel. Right? So this shows that the shekel was not a, a lot of money. And the Mosai said, the rich man... Um, can't give more than the shekel and the poor man can't um, give less. And we know that the Most High has mercy upon the poor. So he's not going to burden him with, um, you know, a huge tax, right? Also, uh, as for the proof, let's go to Mark 12. <laughs> as for the proof that the shekel... The temple tax was um, small. Let's go from uh, verse uh, 41 and 42. This is the book of Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. Yeah. And Yehoshai sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. Mm -hmm. and, many that, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor woman, a certain poor widow, and she threw in 
two mites which which make a farthing. Right. And he called unto his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. You see that? So yeah, how was I saw the small amount that this lady um, put in to the treasury, and he said she put the most in because that was that that was all she had. So look how much respect the king of kings had unto this lady's offering. Now, to put this into perspective, I went and um, looked at what two mites would be worth today. Watch this. It says, uh, this is on a Samford University website, okay? Uh, so, yeah, wait. Yeah, Samford University library website. It said, the mite also known as a lepton was a Jewish coin and the smallest used in New Testament time. This should say Hebrew. Um, at the time of Mark's writing, it was worth uh, 1 64th of a denarius. A denarius, here's the key, was a day's wage for a common worker. In today's terms, it would be worth about a quarter of a cent. Uh, sorry, one eighth of a cent. The one pictured below is believed to have been minted between 103 to 76 BC, okay? So this they actually have a picture of a mite here, okay? That they dug up, all right? And this is it compared to a penny. Now, this is a bit misleading because it says it would be worth about an eighth of a cent. Now, if you try to buy this mite today for an eighth of a cent, you think you're going to be able to buy it from this museum for an eighth of a cent? No, you will not be able to buy this thing for an eighth of a cent. It, it sure as hell costs a lot more than that, right? But here's the key. A denarius was a day's wage for a common worker, right? And the, the, the um, mite was worth 164th of a denarius. So I took it upon myself to go and do the calculation and see, okay, based on today's wages of a common worker at minimum wage, what would 164th of a, of a minimum wage worker's um, day's wage be, right? And uh, it turns out it would be about a dollar and 39 cents. So yeah, how I watch this lady throw in a dollar and 39 cents and says she put in more than all these other people because that's all she had. She poor, she only have a dollar and 39 cents to her name and she put it all in the treasury, right? So all this proves that the Most High, when he's asking for um, his offerings, is always asking for a small amount. And this further proves that the MR is the smallest of these three uh, measures, right? And that's what we would have to bring for the offering. So then how much weight is that today? So according to the complete works of Josephus by William Whiston in uh, 1999 on page 1089, it says the ephah is 41.74 uh, pounds, right? One tenth of that would be 4.7 pounds. This is the weight of the MR, okay? The MR is 4.17 uh, pounds, all right? Let's go into this book. Right. Um, let's go into this book here. Whoops. Sorry, one second. There we go. All right. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. Where it that's odd. 
Oh, it's on the wrong page. 188. There we go. Page 188, right here, it says um, the, the ephah, right? Remember the scripture said the ephah and the bath is the same? Josephus, this first century, meaning in the first hundred years after Yahushai died, he, this historian said that the ephah was uh, this Hebrew historian. I believe he was a Hebrew. Um <clears throat> I, I'm leaning towards him being a Hebrew. He said uh, the ephah was 41.74 pounds. See that? So one-tenth of that would be 4.17. <clears throat> so this is the page in the book, The New Complete Works of Josephus, okay? And Josephus created this book in the um, early uh, 70s, 70s, 80s, okay. all right? So that being said, the MR, which is the smallest weight, is 4.17 pounds, all right? The HIN, Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19, Verse 36, just balances, just weights, adjust ephah and adjust him. Shall ye have, I am Yahweh your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am Yahweh. So you see, I wasn't just talking out of my head when I told you, you got to observe the Mosai's commandments, all of them, right? That's why we're doing this work. We're putting in work. Right, Because your wages are according to your works. Your faith is shown by your works. Right, Faith without uh, deeds is dead. Right? Uh, therefore, uh, thus saith the Lord. Therefore shall you observe to do all my statutes and judgments and do them. Just balances, just weights, just ephah, and just him. Shall you have. I am Yahweh. Right? I just him. And this word is actually him. Well done, translators. Okay. So what is the hin? What is the model measurement of the hin? It is 14.3 pints. So for our wine offering, right? The most I asked for um, a fourth part of an hin. Okay. So if 14.3 pints is a hin, all right? Uh, 3.575 pints is the fourth part of a hin. And how do we know 14.3 pints is a hin? Well, I have two witnesses here, right? Right? This book here, This book here called What Did the Bible Writers Know and When Did They Know It? What Archaeology Can Tell Us About the Re Reality of Ancient Israel by Deva William G, published in 2001. All right. Um, this person says, watch this. says, now we actually have just such a libation vessel specifying wine libations. You hear that? Because these uh, drinks were poured out to the Most High. But when there is more information on the new decanter, but there is more information on the new decanter, the liquid measure of the wine to be offered one quarter. The larger unit is not noted, probably because it was so well known that it was assumed. Here we have, however, a direct convergence with such biblical texts as Exodus 29.40 and Leviticus 23.13, which specifically state that the libation offering is to be a quarter of a hin of wine. From the other texts, as well as from 
excavated ceramic vessels and the evidence. So they got this from excavated ceramic um, vessels, real life vessels. We can calculate that the biblical liquid measure in was equal to one six of a bath. Thus, since the bath equaled about 5.5 gallons, the hin was a little less than one gallon. And when you do the conversion, one gallon is 14.3 pints. Dutch and Heltzer report that the one quarter decanter has a liquid capacity when full of 12 70 centimeters or about 1.3 liters, a little more than five cups. One fourth of a hin of CA, one gallon would be about a quart, not only within the range of a five cup decanter, but a suitable amount for a small libation, especially if we are dealing with the daily offerings of poor people, right? So now we have a history book um, uh, bringing out the same thing that I was bringing out through the scriptures that, you know, the most I do knows that we are poor people. We live off the land. So he's not exacting, you know, huge taxes from us essentially, right? Um, so that's it. That's all, right? That's where uh, we got the, I got the information. And then I went and I just uh, converted it into today's measures. You can double check it yourself. Um, therefore, the fourth part of an hin is 3.57 uh, pints, which is equal to 1.69 liters or just over a liter and a half, okay? Just over a liter and a half is basically uh, three bottles of water, uh, three of the 500 milliliter bottles of water, um, plus a little bit. All right. So in conclusion, uh, we're going to read uh, Numbers 15, verse 1 to 5, uh, trying to put in the weights that we have. And Yahweh speak unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye be come into the land of your habitations, which I give you, and will make an offering by fire unto Yahweh, a burnt offering or a sacrifice in performing a vow or a free will offering, or in your solemn feast, to make a sweet savour unto Yahweh, of the herd or of the flock, then shall he that offereth his offering unto Yahweh bring a grain offering of a tenth, right, of an emar of 4.1 pounds of flour, fine flour, right? Mingled with the fourth part of an hin of oil, mingled with 1.69 liters of oil and 1.69 liters of wine or a drink offering shall thou prepare uh, for a drink offering shall thou prepare with the burnt offering or sacrifice for what one full lamb right and then you you just double that and triple that those numbers for the um the full ram offering and the full bullock um, offering right so I'll praise to the Most High. Those are the biblical um, weights and measures. Uh, I pray you guys were edified. Um, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Uh, if not, enjoy the rest of the Shabbat. And uh, may the Most High bless and keep all Israel and uh, bring death and destruction to our enemies even till the coming of our Lord Yahweh Shai. Hallelujah. Shalom. Shalom and happy Sabbath, everyone. Enjoy your evening. All right, all right.